Now we're going to start looking at some of this education in Louisiana. Now one thing, no matter what side of the fence you're on, we can probably all agree that we want to get the best teachers possible into the classroom and ensure that they are doing their jobs in the most effective way. Sounds simple, right? But you see, here's where we get to some problems where what sounds simple really isn't as simple as people on both sides are trying to make it out to be. So let's listen first to a little bit about what Governor Jindal had to say. We passed some other bills as well. Passed a value-added assessment model to evaluate teachers based on student growth from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year. So that way we could actually tie teacher performance, teacher uh, uh, evaluations to student effectiveness. Basically said, let's reward and encourage those teachers that are taking kids below grade level and getting them to above grade level. One of the unions came out and publicly said to me and the, the public said, we're all for teacher evaluations. Just don't tie it so closely to student achievement. It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. It'd be like going to a football game and not worrying about the score. How in the world do you evaluate a teacher unless you're looking at student achievement? Now, one of these arguments in Louisiana is whether or not teacher evaluation should be tied closely to student performance. Now, what they want to do is create this value-added statistical formula to try and equalize variables such as the available prior achievement of the student. They also look at things like gifted status, attendance, disability status, free and reduced meal eligibility, limited English proficiency, prior discipline history, and classroom composition variables. Now a teacher has to rate as highly effective or they face the possibility of termination and their salary is going to fluctuate according to their ratings on this value added model. Now simple common sense tell me that someone who is highly effective at what they do should be rewarded more than someone who is ineffective. If you are ineffective at a given task it don't matter if you've been doing that same task for 20 years or for two years. You know, I just can't find any logic when seniority should matter if the senior person is ineffective while the junior person has proven to be effective. The problem is, however, what is the definition of effectiveness? let alone how you going to rate it based on such limited statistical points. The arguments of standardized test scores and we're going to compare how the student performed at the beginning of the year to how the student performed at the end of the year just don't cut it in the real world. The comparing of those numbers to numbers produced by students with the same value added criteria to gauge the level of progress also don't work. We're not dealing with identical items here. There are an infinite number of variables which you just can't weight statistically. They're also presuming that a student can only learn about a specific subject and of course covering that subject. Why do they want to compartmentalize learning into all these little separate convenient containers? We already know that we don't all learn in the same manner. Even people with them advanced education degrees, they'll tell you about people having different learning styles. We don't all grow at the same rate. So why is it being argued that these are all evaluation models that specific information can only be learned in specific courses and that it's going to take place according to these charts and figures. i tell you why. Because all of that fancy talk make it easy to fool the public. Now 
Now, I know some of you might be saying that I've been out in the sun too long, or heck, maybe I done been hit in the head by one of the Ted's on the shrimp trawls. But, why don't we think about it like this? You a baseball coach in high school. You get this freshman pitcher. He is dominating every game he go into. Because he's been blessed with all these physical tools. And he is just bigger, stronger, and faster than most of the people his own age. But one thing you notice is when the boy pitches, it's very awkward. And the way he's twisting his arm, it's going to put additional stress on his elbow. So you, in that young boy's best interest, you're going to start altering how the boy throws the ball. You know, changing his mechanics. And as a result, that young man who was supposed to be so dominant really becomes an average pitcher that season. And every time that he tries to go back with that awkward delivery where he can hurt his elbow, you take and pull him off the mound. And at the end of the season, the boy for the first time in his life, he's lost some games and your team has a losing record. Now think about what happened with the teachers here. Same thing with that coach. The coach, he's blamed for the performance drop on the field. And he's fired. But let's look at that picture. He's now started to develop some consistency in the delivery that the coach taught him. He becomes better his sophomore year. Improves some more his junior year. <clears throat> By the time that young man is a senior in high school, he's still got the physical tools and he's got the mechanics that make him desired in the baseball world. His biggest hassle now is to decide, do I sign that minor league contract? Because I've been picked high in the draft? Or do I go on to college and accept one of these many Division I offers that I've done received? Now, both colleges and the Major League Baseball, they're wondering, well, the boy's got all the tools, but possibly something might be physically wrong with him, so we want you to undergo a physical examination to see an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports medicine. Well, that surgeon, in preparing for the examination, he's actually seen films of the young man pitching back there in junior high <coughs> and pitching today and how he changed his delivery. And with that exam and with some MRIs, that orthopedic surgeon say that if that young man had continued to pitch the way he had been, the torque would have damaged his elbow enough that he wouldn't be able to pitch anymore. But now, he ain't got no problem pitching. So you tell me, what's better? Was it better for that young man to face some adversity as a freshman and having to change what he was doing? Or would it have been better to allow him to continue hurting his elbow and taking his career away? Now you're asking, what does all that mean? Look at it from a teacher's standpoint with these value-added models in a way they're trying to judge effectiveness. If the teacher does what is in the best interest of the student, meaning preparing them for the next level 
and preparing them to have the best opportunity for a future. That might actually involve pulling the student back a little bit and changing some of the stuff that they're doing. But in looking out for the student's best interest, you're only judged by that student, their amount of increase from point A to point B. If they happen to stay the same, or they fall back any, you're the one at fault because you're not competent. You don't know what you're doing. But they don't take into account that we're not talking about each step being the completion. Each step is actually one step on the ladder to keep raising the student up. And that's one of the problems with this here evaluation. I do have to tell you, my little boy, my youngest is five, went to school. He was so proud, you know, going to big boy's school. And in their school, they get cards. You know, when they behave, they get a green card. They misbehave, they get a red card and yellow in between. One day, he was on his first day of big boy's school. I told him, I said, now, look, son, I said, you've got to get a green card. You've got to behave at school. He comes home that day with a yellow card. I said, Slade, what happened? I thought we were going to get a green card. He said, Daddy, my teacher doesn't give green cards. I said, Dad, Slade, look, I, I know your teacher. I said, work harder. I know you can get a green card tomorrow. But I said, look, I'll make you a deal. You get five green cards in a row. Daddy will take you to the toy store and buy you whatever toy you want. Sure enough, the very next day he comes home, he brings home his first green card. I was so proud of him. I said, now remember, five in a row and you get to go to the toy store. I love how honest our children are. My little boy climbs up into my lap, puts his little hands up, grabs my face, and says, Daddy, this is the last green card I'm bringing home all year. He said it was too much work. <laughs> he decided the toy just wasn't worth it. He wasn't going to behave just to get a toy. Now let's look at a little double standard here. From the same talk, Governor Jindal's going to describe this teaching opportunity with his son. Now, the governor's son apparently has the capability to earn one of them green cards from the teacher. But on the first day, he got a yellow card. And he said that teacher just don't give green cards. But the governor himself, he said he knows the teacher. And the teacher is qualified and very capable Well, he didn't make a deal with his son saying that, hey, I want you to work harder for that green card, and if you get five green cards in a row, you're going to get rewarded. So the little boy goes to school the next day, he come back with that green card. But look what he tell his daddy. He tell his daddy that this is going to be the last green card he bring home because it just ain't worth all the trouble. Now, who's going to face the repercussions from that? It's the teacher. Because if the student decides it's not worth it, the student's not going to put in the effort they're capable of doing. It's the teacher's job, according to these evaluations, to inspire that student or to force them or coerce them or somehow get them to perform at the higher level. <coughs> I would say... There's a little bit more involved here. What about the parent? Now, I've got no evidence, but I would guess that the governor and Mrs. Jindal especially are excellent parents. They both have high education. And I'm sure that they are going to foster 
a love for lifelong learning in their children. <laughs> Yet, listening to Governor Jindal talk about his son here, if his effectiveness as a parent were going to be based on the same criteria as that used to judge the effectiveness of a teacher, his son might be taken away so that his son can be placed with a highly effective parent. A parent who is capable of getting his son to earn the above average cards. Because obviously, Governor Jindal, in his approach of get the green card five days in a row, you'll get a reward, just ain't working. So, that young man, in his best interest, should be put with someone who is highly effective at getting him to get to his highest potential. Now, is evaluation necessary? Is evaluation beneficial? I say yes. But is there an easy method or solution on how you're going to do it? I doubt it. Now, I personally believe that we cannot separate what happens in the classroom from what takes place in society. Nor can classroom problems be viewed as confined to different grades or levels. Things just don't go into these convenient little categories that everybody wants to create. What we need is a strong commitment to learning and a respect for education in the home. Learning, education, schooling, they're not always the same thing. But if we have that commitment and respect in the home before that child walks into his first formal classroom, that's going to make that elementary teacher more effective. And if students come from effective elementary schools, that's going to make the middle school or junior high teachers more effective. Then if you got effective junior high middle school teachers, that's going to allow those high school teachers, when they get to students, to start introducing them to possibilities they might not ever had realized what's possible. Because a student has that curiosity. He or she wants to learn. And they know some of the tools and how to use them. And then that young man or young lady wants to continue in a formal education by going to a college or a university, those teachers can show them how to open those doors and continue on their respective journey using the tools and having the confidence to open the additional doors that they will find along the way. Because learning doesn't stop. We need to build upon what we learn. We do that in life. So why is it when we're talking about what is best for education, we're saying that looking at these test scores and determining how well a student does from day one to day 100 is more important than how that student has grown throughout the entire process and has the tools and the ability 
to continue to grow afterwards. I mean, we hear all this stuff about we got to increase the number of graduates. We got to increase retention. Well, there are easy ways to make them numbers. And that's what's happening. You lower the standards. You see, why don't we have the focus on, not on the numbers, but on the quality of the content, the quality of the education. You see, the problem is you can't put that in numbers as easily as you can what they're trying to do. And these people making the rules, what if they were being judged by the same criteria? They wouldn't like it. They wouldn't survive. Like they always say, if it's good enough for someone else to do, it should be good enough for you to do. But that ain't the case. Now let's think about that for a while. Later here we're going to come back and talk about some other aspects of these education reforms. Thank y'all very much.